So we have got a super exciting webinar today. We've got uh, Dr. Kevin Corb joining us. Uh, Kevin is an honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne. He specialises in Bayesian reasoning and causal Bayesian networks. Uh, he's been involved with several uh, really cool tools, so in the development of CAMEL for causal discovery via MML, uh, which is a tool that learns uh, causal Bayesian networks from observational data. Uh, he's also been involved in the development of the BARD project, which is Bayesian augmentation via Delphi process, so for expert elicitation. And today, Kevin is going to be uh, talking about causal Bayesian networks with a bit of overview of their prehistory. So, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's great to have you here, and over to you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My slides are visible, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. We can see the slides. Yep. Okay, so I'll just talk through the slides today um, fairly quickly. Don't worry about the details. I'm not going to go into details or the mathematics of anything, <clears throat> but uh, but just an overview. Um, my goodness. Sorry, don't quite know how to work this. I, I find out as I go along, I guess. And so do you. <clears throat> so there's a, a brief bio of me. Um, and that's the abstract I produced. So somebody asked me to talk about path models and I'm, I'm happy to talk about them, but I'll be talking about other things as well. So I've made it a little bit more general. Basically, I've called it a prehistory of Bayesian nets because almost everything I'll talk about is before 1988, basically, which, uh, which is the date of Judeo Pearl's um, seminal work on Bayesian networks, and that's what introduced me personally to Bayesian nets. In fact, uh, caught my attention in Silicon Valley when I was uh, about to give it up and go back and finish my PhD. Uh, so graphical modeling, um, as far as anyone can, uh, can attest to at any rate, seems to begin with Richard Whateley's Elements of Logic, which uh, produced this very first argument map. An argument map is, a, is just a special kind of Bayesian net, in fact. Um, so the way he has it at the top is uh, the conclusion that you're trying to argue for. And at each level below that are either premises or intermediate conclusions, which directly support the conclusion above. And you just work yourself down to premises that you're not going to be bothered to prove or argue for um, either because they're from some acceptable source or because it's a kind of working hypothesis for an argument. So each of the connections here is effectively a link in a Bayesian net and the dependency relations between premises and conclusions are all or nothing typically. I mean what what he was talking about at any rate were um, ordinary deductive logic arguments. So that would be probability one or zero, depending on whether you got it right or wrong. Um, but nevertheless, a kind of Bayesian net that, that introduces a kind of graphical tool for reasoning about dependencies. And so there's your first Bayesian net. A um, hundred years after that, John Wigmore used uh, similar maps. Um, in legal arguments, he was a, he was a legal um, academic. But 10 years after that, Sewell Wright started working on path models. And that's far and away the most interesting um, early appro graphical approach to, to um, probabilistic reasoning. These path models are actually worth looking at if you're, if you're doing statistics and you're interested in linear models of phenomena, um, they're, they're basically the best technology available for that particular reason, uh, purpose. If you have um, continuous variables that you either know or suspect or can be reasonably approximated by linear relationships, then what you do is you standardize them so that each variable uh, has the distribution uh, normal zero, one. With all the variables standardized, 
Sewell Wright developed and proved the correctness of a, of a number of different, um, they were algorithms effectively, but things that he executed himself on paper, uh, which from uh, observed correlations between all the variables produced path coefficients, which are the A1, A2, and so on here, path coefficients, which mediate, which represent the mediation of, um, of causal influences <clears throat> from each variable to the next. So on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, you have U, which is whatever variation in Y, the variable of interest in this case, um, is left unexplained by its actual known parents, which are X1 and X2. <clears throat> so on the right-hand side, actually here, we just have a really trivial kind of um, graph, which looks sort of like a regression equation, but it doesn't have to look like that. The, you can have any network, you can embed Y in any kind of linear network and then each of the variables will get their own use, uh, which, which he wouldn't represent by writing it into the graph. Um, and then his methods allow you to break down the correlations into effectively causal co coefficients. So his problem was not the problem of, of either um, Wigmore or Waitley. Uh, it wasn't the problem of simply representing dependencies. It was specifically to uh, find what sort of weight, causal weight, to give to the different uh, parents or ancestors to an outcome variable Y. So it was distributing causal attribution across the network. And he, he produced and proved, as I said, um, correct methods for doing this. Uh, there are various assumptions. Of course, it has to be linear. Uh, the U itself is assumed to be Gaussian, which is the usual assumption in science that your noise variable is, is uh, randomly distributed as a Gaussian and is also unrelated to any of the other variables except for that to which is directly connected. So there aren't any hidden common causes or back paths or what have you between U and X1 or any of the other Xs. And he also explicitly assumed that the arcs are causal which is there an important assumption. Sorry? Yeah, I can't hear those questions. If you've got questions you can't get through, you can go ahead and chat them. Uh, okay, so I provided a method and then demonstrated uh, this Theorem that path coefficients are equal to the square root of the variation in the child variable attributable to the parent. So that gives you a direct measure of um, how much one cause is causing an effect versus how much another one is causing an effect, which is a problem I get to at the end as well, because I'm still interested in that problem, um, extrapolating or extending it to Bayesian nets generally, or causal Bayesian nets generally. Right, right developed rules for decomposing correlations into the sums of products of path coefficients. And this is, I guess, where it gets interesting for Bayesian net modelers, because basically he came up with the rules for deseparation about 100 or 80, whatever, years before Pearl. And Pearl acknowledges that, by the way. At the end, I'll give you, I'll point you to a, a popular book he's written, recently written or co-written um, where he discusses this stuff. Uh, so he, he developed graphical rules for decomposing correlations, I think I already said that, into sums of products of path coefficients. So basically, he came up with rules for describing paths to be uh, put into that, um, that equation. And the paths that he came up with were all, all and only those which are active paths under deconnection rules. Except... Well, we'll get to the exception later. Correlation results in causal influence along active paths between variables, and it's nearly identical to the idea of deconnection. Uh, okay. So we can call it an admissible, an, a path admissible between XI and XJ, if and only if it's an undirected path connecting XI and XJ, 
that does not go against the direction of a causal arc after having gone forward. So what does that mean? I can illustrate it with Pearl's own alarm network. On the right hand side, we have the ultimate causes of burglary and quakes. In the middle, uh, alarm, and at the end, uh, Pearl's two neighbors calling him at work. So if you look at all, find all the paths where you can traverse it without first going forward and then going backwards, well, that, that last uh, proviso rules out, of course, burglary causing quakes, because burglary, you go forward, and then you're trying to go backwards to quake, and that's not allowed. So that is not a deconnected path. On the other hand, you can go from John calls to backwards to alarm, and then forwards to Mary, because you're going backwards, yes, but you're doing that before going forwards. So, so that sort of um, uh, common ancestor or common cause is perfectly allowable in path, path modeling rules. And of course, direct chains from burglary down to John Calls or whatever are, are perfectly admissible as well. So we get exactly the rules of deseparation, uh, with the exception there at the bottom. So this is identical to Pearl's deseparation rules, except that it doesn't take into account observed colliders. So if you have an observed collider, which 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 you did, by the way, he was of course interested in looking up uh, not just correlations, but partial correlations. But if you have an observed collider whose rules wouldn't accommodate that. Um, and I guess the relevant point is, I don't, I don't have no idea if he thought about that at all, in any case, but um, that's not really what causal attribution is about. The kinds of paths you relate by observing colliders, the kinds of pathways you, you activate that way in deconnection de are not causal pathways. There are probabilistic dependency pathways that mess up the causal interpretation. So Wright's work, he did, he did quite a lot of work on this as well as in, I mean, genetics was his main field. Um, and that work was quite influential <clears throat> and led basically to 50 years of statistical, uh, technical investigation of statistical methods, including structural equation modeling including structural equation modeling and econometrics, where it's one of the more popular tools, and also Hubert Blaylock's causal analysis methods, which were slightly different, working with a kind of algebra of expectations. Um, as Pearl notes in, in the book, I'll show you at the end, um, these techniques pretty much wandered away from the causal interpretation. They they either ignored or kind of poo-pooed the causality behind the modeling, <clears throat> which Pearl himself calls in, in the book a betrayal of right. So now I'm gonna jump over to my own kind of background at the time, at the time I read Pearl's book, which is probabilistic causality, which I'd been introduced to in graduate school in the 70s, and um, done a fair bit of work on. Philosophy of science during all of this time, that is to say the 20th century, uh, was trying to understand causality. Of course, they were trying to understand it from a long time before that, beginning at least with Aristotle. But uh, from the time of David Hume, the popular idea was that causality would somehow be um, analyzed into a set of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, preceding where a cause or a set of causes is preceding some effect. Um, where the events in question would be contiguous, there'd be temporal priority, there'd be constant conjunction. The, the limitation there is the constant conjunction, right? So if you have some kind of stochastic cause, it, it simply doesn't count. The assumption would be that there, was, uh, there were missing conditions that you hadn't identified yet, and eventually science would catch up with, with the issue. So in short, causality is some deterministic function of necessary sufficient conditions reducing causal talk to those about deterministic conditions. Um, so this is an interesting kind of uh, research tradition. So it spans, like I said, centuries, at least from Hume to the 1970s. And uh, in Imre Lakatos's language, you could call it a kind of degenerating research program because 
it was constantly throwing up, you would come up with a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, which would work for all the, all the obvious cases that people have been talking about. And then somebody would come up with uh, an anomaly, uh, a situation that it doesn't actually account for our understanding of causality. And it would all go up in disarray. People find some other kind of epicycle to throw onto it. And eventually it became ridiculously complicated Inus condition analysis by, um, hell, I forget the name of the guy, but anyway, by somebody rather. And um, nobody was really taking it seriously anymore, at least not people who weren't invested in that program. However, in parallel, uh, beginning with quantum mechanics, I suppose, or, or maybe uh, statistical mechanics before that, people started taking probability and stochasticity seriously. Hans Reichenbach, in his posthumous book, Common, uh, sorry, Direction of Time, introduced the common cause principle, where he really forced the understanding of causality into a probabilistic direction. In, in that book, he's no longer aiming for a reductive account of causality, trying to reduce causality to a language of, of necessary and sufficient conditions. Instead, prob probabilities supervene on an underlying stochastic structure. And if you don't understand supervenience, um, I will introduce it. The common cause principle, um, it's, it's not literally framed this way, but what it amounts to is the statement that enduring correlations between any two variables, A and B, result from an underlying causal structure. So either A causes B directly or indirectly, or B causes A directly or indirectly, or there's some common ancestor or the correlation isn't enduring after all, you were just suffering from some illusion. In short, magic doesn't exist. So Reichenbach was a strong believer in scientific method and that it should be able to uncover relations, enduring relations between any two variables. And also, in case you don't know, the flip side of this common cause principle is that the statistician's mantra that correlation does not imply causation is mostly wrong. And I've got a link here I won't click on because it will send my talk, talk haywire. But if you want to click on it later, you'll see that I've written a, a short diatribe of my own on that subject. And, and I say they're mostly wrong because, of course, there are cases where the, they're absolutely right. You come across a correlation where there isn't any causality. But those are more the exceptions than the rules. And the typical example of post hoc ergo propter hoc is, is actually not an example at all. Post hoc ergo propter hoc is generally explained by um, one or another situation, and frequently it's a causal situation. Or typically, it's a causal situation. OK, so here's an example of the common cause principle in action, if you like. We have socioeconomic status on the left at time zero. We have sex at time zero. We have educational attainment. We have economic well-being. Now, all of these are <clears throat> probabilistically dependent upon each other, and the data can show that. Dependency between the top two is not marginal, but if you condition on either of the lower two variables, <clears throat> you'll get a conditional dependency. And this is the kind of situation where, in fact, causal discovery from observations alone is quite sufficient to recover 100% of the causal structure, which is something you would not expect if you believed the orthodox statisticians. So this is the structure you can, you'll get if you get enough observations. You'll certainly get all the direct dependencies between, say, sex and education or sex and economic well-being. And those things come up uh, out of the data directly from Perl and Verma's uh, original algorithm for recovering not, not the causal Bayesian network, but for recovering the, um, the pattern, the set of causal Bayesian networks, which are statistically equivalent, that is to say, can be parameterized so as to represent exactly the same class of probability distributions. So we get all the direct connections, and the indirect connections um, are also there to be found. What, what, what that means, basically, is that we have two colliders here. And when you condition on either collider, you induce a dependency between SES and sex. 
And that is shown through the orientation of the arcs. So if you didn't even have the time uh, flags to indicate which thing is coming after what else, you could still orient the arcs because you get these conditional dependencies happening. So about supervenience, what on earth is that? Um, in some people's vocabulary, it's a fancy word for reduction. Um, but I will show you why that's actually wrong. So reduction, reductionism was all the, the rage in philosophy and, and science too, I guess, for nearly the last couple hundred years. Um, the idea of reduction in philosophy at any rate is that you provide a one-to-one -one correspondence between two levels of existence so that the higher level language can be eliminated. So the purpose was to get rid of higher level language and reduce all talk to a lower level language, which was supposedly more scientific. <clears throat> so part of the point of this talk is to arm you with intellectual self-defense against people who accuse you of being a reductionist for using a, a technical method like Bayesian network modeling. So here's the, the classical philosophical example of reduction, um, mind-brain identity theory. So there the claim is that mental states are actually just brain states, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between them. <clears throat> Most prominently uh, uh, campaigned for, for this particular point of view actually were uh, Australian philosophers like Jack Smart. So at the top of this image, there's a kind of mental graph which indicates what's going on men in the mental life of somebody or other. And that somebody or other is, is the brain below that. So there's supposed to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the brain and, and that higher level stuff, which, uh, which effectively explains the higher level stuff. It instantiates it. So that's if, if that's a one-to-one -one relationship, then the interesting thing is that the higher level uh, mental life or whatever can't actually be instantiated by any other brain, which is a very strange way of talking uh, if you think about it. For example, our brains are changing all the time, so that means our mental lives are changing all the time. Okay, that might keep in step. But we have um, relatives, peers, and so forth that also have brains, but they're not the same brains, so they can't be instantiated the same higher level language in the same way. Here's a more extreme example that Hilary Putnam came up with to refute or reject um, mind-brain identity theory and, and, and reduction in particular, in general, rather. Um, so if you've ever watched a Twilight Zone show or something where some hyper-intelligent alien lands on Earth and gets angry with uh, mere humans and starts shooting them to death and stuff like that, the mind-brain identity theory would say that their mental lives aren't the same as ours and we can't use the same language to talk about them. And so we can't say that they have a certain belief or get angry, and, and we can't predict what they'll do. Um, but uh, Putnam, of course, says that that's just silly. That's not anyone's response to Twilight Zone. Instead, they respond by being um, uh, appropriately scared at the right moments. So the point of supervenience is that reduction is a kind of quizzical dream. And what we're really talking about is multiple realizability or multiple ways of instantiating the same mental processes. So you can instantiate them in a human brain, in a bird brain, if they're not too, if they're not playing chess, if they're doing something bird-like, or in an alien brain or in a robot. And they can all be the very same sort of mental processes. So the Reichenbachian idea that probabilistic structure supervenes on causal structure is exemplified in causal B Bn's. And if you think about it a bit, you, you probably realize you've already encountered it if you studied Bayesian-Nets. The very same probability distribution can be implemented in a large class of causal Bayesian networks. And that's exactly what supervenience is. This is the philosophical foundation for inverse inference from data. You collect observational correlations, or a probabilistic structure. And from that, you can infer likely generative models. And quite generally, um, they're underdetermined. So 
there's a maybe a large set or an infinite set of causal models that could explain that probabilistic structure, but some will be more likely than others. And there'll be another large uh, infinite set of models that are ruled out. And also it's the basis for philosophical functionalism, which is the idea that um, the mental states and properties of humans can be identified with brain functions, uh, not, not identified in the reductive sense, but identified in the supervenient sense. So these two traditions, probabilistic causality, which I came from, and Bayesian networks in AI and statistics collided in, when Perl's 1988 book came out. The, the philosophers, by the way, prior to that, were slowly inching their way towards some, some kind of account of deseparation without being aware of, of Sewell Wright or Judea Pearl. If you, if you read the, that uh, philosophical tradition, you'll see that Reichenbach was in it, his student Wesley Salmon was involved in that, Patrick Supis, they, they were all developing rules which were inching towards a complete account of deseparation, and I figure might have gotten there 50 years later. However, Pearl published his book and um, philosophy of science immediately jumped on Bayesian networks as the right tool for reasoning about causality. Uh, five minutes left, Kevin. I don't have five minutes to, to fill, sorry. This is my last contentful slide. So it just uh, points out that Stephen Mascaro, Eric Nyberg and I are working on uh, this potential kind of extrapolation of, of Sewell Wright's causal attribution methods to arbitrary discrete Bayesian networks. Well, not arbitrary, causal, they have to be causal. If they're not causal, then we will still give you ca uh, causal attribution measures. It's just that they will be guaranteed to be wrong pretty much. Um, so CAT is a tool that we've uh, developed and are continuing to develop. You're welcome to share in its use and development. Uh, you can upload causal Bayesian networks. You can do basic probabilistic updating, although if what you're really doing is probabilistic modeling, you'd be far better off using a, a proper tool for that. You can also do causal interventions where it's somewhat different from a typical Bayesian network tool. So you can see what the effect is of intervening causally on an, an arbitrary variable might be to, uh, to variables downstream. And we have a number of causal attribution measures, which we hope to enhance with more because they're competing sorts of measures out there. Anyway, we have a number of causal attribution measures which you can take on uh, given the observations, given the interventions, and it will tell you how much um, one, one cause is contributing to some effect. And so finally, I'm going to advertise on behalf of Judeo Pearl here. This, uh, this is a popular book. It's not a technical book. It says the new signs of cause effect. It it's basically goes into both the prehistory and the history of Bayesian nets for causal analysis, including, of course, Pearl's own work in the area. The, the, the nice thing about this is, yeah, A, it's popular, and, and B, it's well-written. Um, he, he doesn't actually... Judea Pearl doesn't actually acknowledge the help of Mackenzie in the text, <clears throat> but it's kind of obvious if you've read Pearl in the in, in Gone Native, in his own, right, he's very hard to read, but this book is very easy to read. And some references, and that's all I got. So I provided the, the PDF um, to your host, so you should be able to pick that up if you want. And you can you can click on those links. That's it. <laughs>